Uh, Jay, before you cut off, if mm-hmm. I could ask, um, did you want to maybe make an announcement with regards to what uh, Zeminence Metropolitan Jonah has planned for the server? Uh, sure. If you want, if you do, you want to go ahead and announce it. Go ahead. Yeah, I can just announce it. So we're we're waiting on some more information. Uh, hopefully, forthcoming next week sometime. But uh, His Eminence Metropolitan Jonah has offered to start up a weekly catechetical lecture series right here on Jay's Discord. So stay tuned for that. Uh, we'll make some uh, more prominent announcements as we get more information. Uh, but hopefully next week we'll uh, we'll have a set time and date when all this stuff is going to happen. Cool. Being yeah, cool. and a reminder to everyone uh, watching the stream: if you want, please do come to the Discord. I'll greet you personally myself. We'll ask all your dumb questions. Blah 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 blah. Love all of you. Jay, make sure to put my Twitter down there because I want that internet clout. You know. I know. I will do that for all of you. I promise. By, by the way, hop over to uh, Sam Shamoon at Shamoonian's channel. He did an interview with Craig on the uh, Orthodox view of salvation, and I listened to as much of it as I could, and it was actually be really, really, really good. So, um, go and watch it after Jay's finishes. <laughs> Don't. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. After, after guys. I mean, uh, am I going to be cutting into a lot of people's streams? Uh, is Kotel doing one? I don't know. It's okay. I mean, everybody can eventually watch. You can always their... come back and watch them yeah, again. Yeah, it's, it's not a big deal how many people are watching live. But uh, I am going to cover because I've got so many notes on uh, on um, Pelicon. Um, I took hundreds of pages of notes, and I also have hundreds of pages of notes. Uh, well, about a hundred pages of notes on the Medieval Heresy book, which I also want to get into that. Not today, but uh, in the next week, I want to try to do a, a lot of really high IQ history related streams because. Man, I took all these damn notes. Uh, <laughs> I need to, to do something with all these notes. But uh, thank you guys, uh, and uh, God bless. Everybody have a good weekend. I'm going to keep going, though, Thanks, if you want to join me here. All right, that was fun. We did the Discord thing uh, and everybody doing Q&A. That was a lot of fun. But uh, a lot of people ask, you know, and, or don't have knowledge of the early church and the, the post-apostolic period. And so one of the best academic solid works is the pelican series now I, I read this series back in 2002 um and i've lost my other two volumes they were good uh the the modern one is pretty boring i don't really recommend part five uh the reformation volume is okay but one two and three are the best right because you're go you're going from 100 a.d to 1300 and that's the fun period that's when it's really fun. So I got my big old fat bunch of notes. So let's learn about the early church. Let's learn about, uh, good grief. It's so bright in here, dude. That's better. The emergence of the Catholic tradition. And here we're talking in a sort of broad sense of what we mean by Catholic. And so uh, Pelican takes us to the transition from the Hebrew world into the Gentile world. So the early church, we know in the book of Acts, it's primarily dominated by Jewish believers. Um, the Jew- Jerusalem is the center of Christianity er- early on, right? St. James, right? Acts 15, the Jerusalem Council, um, you know, Cornelius, right? The conversion of Cornelius. So, but from, from Acts 1 up through Acts 10, uh, and then the beginning of the Gentiles coming in, it's a predominantly Jewish phenomenon. This is in the Pauline text and writings, the remnant. This is the remnant Paul is talking about, initially speaking, the faithful Jews who believe in the Messiah. And Kelly notes all, uh, Pelican notes all this, and he says that the the early Christians, being predominantly Jews, saw a lot of continuity with the Old Testament. All right, so that is the correct view. I'm not talking about Messianic Judaism in the like a modern evangelical sense, but this is the real Messianic Judaism we could say right here in the first century. Um, and the early the, the first problems in the church in the Book of Acts and the, in the that transition period, the period of 30, 33 AD to 70 AD, right? With the destruction of, of the temple in 70 AD, that's the transition period. And so, uh, uh, Irenaeus, uh, famously, uh, Jerusalem uh, is called by St. Irenaeus, the church from which every church took its start. 
Jerusalem is the mother church, not the papacy. Jerusalem is the true mother church, according to St. Ernest. Rome, of course, will have a lot of preeminence. It's doubly apostolic, uh, Irenaeus will say. But Irenaeus says that Jerusalem is the mother of all churches. Until 70 AD, tensions between the Gentile and Jew uh, believers were very high. And that's why we have this original struggle as to how to interpret the ceremonial commands of, of the Mosaic period. As converts begin to come in from the Gentile areas, this question becomes less and less important because the majority of the church is becoming Gentile converts. Some of the earliest documents will include the Epistle of Barnabas. The Epistle of Barnabas, of course, is not canonical. It's valuable for its early attestation, and it mentions 70 AD. It, meant, it has a kind of a preterist component to it. However, it's not canonical because it has a very low view of the Old Testament. So it, it's, it's stressing the uh, discontinuity between the Old and the New Testament. There's a struggle over the authority of the Old Testament uh, in this period that's intense, right? Uh, Augustine writes the city of God and he begins his treatise with Abel, Abraham. These are the faithful early fathers of our tradition because they were Gentiles. Noah, Gentile, you see. The point is that they were able to please God before the ceremonial commandments of Moses even came. This is the Pauline argument, right? Paul makes the same argument. The point is that the Mosaic ceremonial commands were not essential to salvation, even in that period. If God could accept Abel, Abraham, uh, you know, Noah before you get ceremonial commands from Moses, then the ceremonial commands from Moses are not essential to salvation. And that's the central, the, the key argument that we're making here. Again, Paul makes the same point. It's a Pauline point. <clears throat> but for, uh, in the mind of, of Augustine, the true city of God, right, is all of God's people from Adam to Noah, to uh, uh, Abraham, to Moses, all the way up to the church. Right? The same church, the church is the city of God throughout all time. It is the heavenly Jerusalem. Virtually every major uh, writer of the first five centuries composed some treatise dealing with this question of Judaism and Old Testament, New Testament relations. So this is a hot topic, right, for, for the first five centuries of the church. Just as much, perhaps, maybe as much as, as Platonism and Neoplatonism are the hot topic. And I'm not talking about hot topic at the mall. Early Christian literature was uh, commonplace in saying that the church is the new Israel. This was the common apologetic of all the church fathers. No question about that. Just a martyr said that Christians keep from the Old Testament what is uh, what conforms to the law of nature. This is uh, dialogue with Trifo the Jew 45.3. The early Christians insisted on the law of nature as the, in essence, what is prior to Mosaic law, right? So the Ten Commandments are really the manifestation of what's quote, natural law in this sense, okay? We're not talking about later Thomistic natural law, right? The, the problem is not over the term, quote, natural law, but what does that mean, right? We're not equivocating on the phrase or the term natural law. We want to know what it means within the system as a whole. That's why uh, Maximus's concept of natural law is logi. That's not what Thomas Aquinas's conception of natural law is. Natural law is the eternal law in Thomism, reflection of God's own nature. Irenaeus says that uh, Irenaeus sees uh, much more continuity than some of the early uh, apologists, right? And by the way, we should admit that the early apologists, this is people like Tatian, uh, a, a student of Justin Martyr, some of these people went crazy. They ended up heretics, okay? So just because there's an early church writer who's an apologist does not mean that they're a saint, does not mean that they're correct in the theology. Some of these guys went crazy. Right? Tatian, I think, became a Marcionist or he, a form of Marcionism. He thought the Old Testament was a different God or this kind of nonsense, right? So some of the early apologists may have had good intentions, but a lot of them were influenced by uh, Hellenic thought. So Irenaeus is unique because Irenaeus, uh, contrary to some of these, quote, apologists, actually sees a lot more continuity between the Old Testament uh, he admits that the Decalogue even has undergone a sort of uh, amplification. Uh, and by that, of course, he means that in the New Testament, 
there's this there's there there is both a continuity and a discontinuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It really depends on what angle or what type of uh, analysis we're doing here, right? If we're trying to understand why Marcion is wrong, which actually Irenaeus has a whole section in uh, against heresies where he refutes Mar- Marcionism on the basis of the continuity between the Old and New Testament, then we're going to stress continuity. However, if we're looking at specific new actions in redemptive history like Pentecost, then obviously we're going to stress and we're going to see a discontinuity between the Old and the New Testament. So both are true from different vantage points. Irenaeus, uh, oh, I already read that. So we, um, this is where we begin to see that the church fathers will stress the spiritual uh, uh, allegorical interpretation of the Old Testament. Now, I did a whole video on this against Father Freeman. You can go watch that. I'm not going to rehearse all that. That does not mean that the texts of the Old Testament are ahistorical. In fact, Irenaeus defends the historicity of the Old Testament. It just means that we don't stick to a one level of interpretation. All right, the historical events become types of spiritual realities. Right? We're not saying that because there's a spiritual interpretation that we can ahistoricize and discount the historical event. They don't do that. That's the Gnostic reading of the text. That's not what we do. So uh, this is why we begin to see the Christological and typological exegesis, which is normative. That's from the apostles. That's not something that church fathers make up. Paul does allegorical, typological exegesis, never to the discounting of the historical meaning. Again, I've said this a hundred times. Galatians 4 specifies that Hagar and Sarah are allegories on the basis of their historicity. I hear my, my back just popped. Oh. The early fathers then, he says, were eager to preach a typological and spiritual exegesis to show that these events of the old testament are types of christ yes well known we've covered this many many times some of the early church fathers such as origin and saint jerome even want went to learn hebrew itself because they wanted to properly exegete the old testament uh, generally speaking it was not until the humanists uh, and the reformers of the 16th century that the knowledge of hebrew became standard for old testament exegesis so in this period, uh, the, you know, the, the church fathers are not typically looking to learn Hebrew because they were relying on the Septuagint, often, generally speaking, right? Unless you were in the Latin West, uh, you know, Jerome and these kinds of people, right? Um, you would be studying the Latin. But there wasn't this emphasis on the original languages that becomes popular during the Reformation period, and this is called Renaissance Humanism. Most Christian doctrine developed uh, by the uh, was developed by church fathers, he says, who were not trained in Hebrew. So that's an interesting uh, development there. I'm glowing here. I'm to, this, is, this is, the light is getting crazy. Irenaeus. Now I've covered. I did a whole talk on Irenaeus against uh, you know Gnostics and whatnot, but. Uh, he has a section we'll review Irenaeus's book uh, against heresies. Irenaeus says that all heresies originate from um, Simon the Sorcerer. Simon, Simon Micus, if you watch the saint, right? Uh, Simon is one of the seven Jewish sects to hamper the church, according to uh, Against Heresies, section 23. St. Cyril of Jerusalem agrees in the Catechetical Lectures. Justin Martyr is the primary critic of Simon Magus in his Apologetic 26.3. Simon's doctrine is, says that he, Simon, is God. Simonianism is a Gnostic doctrine that arose out of his sect. This contributed to the rise of Christian Gnosticism. This teaching eventually became uh, a dualistic system where the flesh is viewed as bad or inherently evil. One of the groups that pops up early on at this period is the Ebionites. They agreed that God created the universe, uh, and but out of these two groups, there arose a group of Ebionites who denied the virgin birth and the divinity of Christ, and thus were Gnostic in that sense. And then another group who uh, believed a lot of other Orthodox doctrine, but they would also ad, uh, affirm Jewish ceremonial laws, and they became known as the Nazarenes. So two different branches of uh, Ebionites there. 
Uh, Pelican notes that Jewish and Christian heresy contributed probably to the origin of Islam uh, on page 25. Yes, we've talked about that uh, for many years as well. Yeah, I'm going to shut this light because I can't even see, dude. It's like direct perception of the sun, which I'm not deified to do yet. All right. There we go. Direct noetic perception of the sun. Let's see. Uh, Pelican attributes uh, the cultic practice and ethics of these groups to influence from uh, early Judaic uh, sects. So this is interesting because he's saying so he's saying Gnosticism itself is. Uh, from early Jewish influence. That's interesting. Because we tend to think of this as like a Far Eastern Platonic type of thing, right? Gnosticism. Um, but I guess nobody really knows the ultimate origin of either one, right? I mean, where does Plato get his doctrines, right? Well, he says we, in the Timaeus, I was just rereading the Timaeus last night, by the way, which I, I do intend to do a, a Timaeus talk, uh, you know, he claims that's from Egypt, right? So who knows? Weird stuff, right? But we have scholars like Pelican to give us kind of the rough outline of, of the best that we can surmise from uh, ancient texts and history. The letters of First Clement uh, began uh, early on to speak of a priesthood and the layman, First Clement 32, 2 and 40, section 5. The Didache and Hippolytus make similar parallels, and so we already, from the earliest days, see a hierarchy in the church. This hierarchy, Pelican notes, also does come from an older practice of Jewish priesthood, Levite, right? So the priest, high priest, priest, Levite, right? Bishop, priest, deacon. Pelican notes that the earliest days of the church were influenced by that structure, uh, from Judaism. Well, yeah, that's in the New Testament, right? The apostles appoint successors. They appoint, you know, elders or presbyterate uh, priesthood and bishops and deacons. Uh, and then, so naturally, this structure of the bishopric would move into the post-apostolic period. And so he notes that Didache, Hippolytus, Irenaeus, Tertullian, uh, specifically, Tertullian in, uh, on Baptism 17.1 likens the bishopric to the high priest. Uh, Chrysostom, uh, he obviously has an entire work on the priesthood. Um, the sacrificial Eucharistic language is all present very early on. Even Epiphanius, right, uh, in Heresies 29.44. So there's not a whole lot of dispute or debate about whether the early church in its first few uh, uh, decades and then uh, first couple centuries had all of these features that Protestants have such a problem with, right? And we want to point that out because how often do we hear the Protestant, Evangelical, Muslim, Baptist come in here and say that everything changed at Nicaea? Constantine turned all this total nonsense, total baloney. Any standard historic academic work that's not even controversial or just go read these church fathers themselves. They point out that this was all present early on. That's actually why some of the sects and weirdos like Anabaptists, they're actually more consistent because they actually will recognize that and be like, Oh, then from the first time the, from, from the post apostolic period, the church apostatized, <laughs> right? So I, Pentecost was, I guess, a big failure, right? The, Jesus didn't actually continue the visible structure of the church. The church just collapsed within one with one one generation after the apostles, right? That's the the ludicrous uh, notion of Protestants who try to be consistent, right? They end up with this Anabaptist thing. Paul Washer, Paul Wa the last time when Paul Washer had me thrown out of a church for asking him questions, which he wanted people to ask questions, had me guys grab me and literally throw me out of the church. I was asking him questions about this. Do you really think the church uh, fell away within the first generation after the apostles? They throw that guy out of here. <laughs> Literally. 
Uh, so, yeah, Paul Washer is never going to be able to answer that question because Paul Washer was literally affirming the Anabaptist position that the church underwent a, it was a blackout, a blackout, Jay, a blackout. Like, what? Dude, you're an idiot. <laughs> what are you talking about? Blackout? This is crazy. Uh, so, Pelican goes on to say that more and more the Old Testament... Uh, was seen to be the model for the New Testament church. Yeah, exactly. And by the way, Lewis is putting out a video that's going to show the continuity of the liturgy between the old to the new. The liturgy of the church is based on the temple and synagogue liturgy. That's where it comes from. So naturally, the structure of the church is going to bear all of the same patterns. People think, the Roman legal system, Pontifex Maximus, created all this stuff from Constantine at Nicaea. What are you talking about? All the stuff of the bishop and the priest, that's all from the, the Old Testament Levite structure, dude. What? What? It has nothing to do with Constantine. All of this stuff is present prior to Constantine. Here's one of the top patristic scholars, history of Christianity, telling you it was all there in the first century, dude. Come on. It's just total ignorance. More and more, the Old Testament forms were applied to the structure of the New Testament church in terms of apologetics. The church is thus the inheritor and was seen to be the fulfillment of the inheritor of the promises to Old Testament Israel. Of course. Christ said, Justin Martyr says that those in Christ are altogether the one synagogue of God. There is a dispute with classical thought. This is key to uh, classical theism, classical apologetics, Hellenism, and the stuff that you've heard me say for many, many years. How do we deal with the apologetics in terms of responding to pagans? This dispute with classical Hellenism um, is seen already early on with the apologists. Then we see Origen in against Celsus the most comprehensive early apologetic in the church. Now, I'm not, we know Origen is a heretic. I'm not defending Origen. Just pointing out that he is the first to write these, like, you know, big, fat, like, uh, expansive, comprehensive, you know, on first principles, for example, attempts uh, or against Celsus, right, uh, to, to address the, uh, the uh, Plotinian, uh, uh, Platonic, critique the greek critique of christianity uh there's one i'm not familiar with quadratus uh one of the earliest uh, apologetics for christianity um uh, eusebius uh, supposedly i think had a an attempt on an apologetic it might be lost um some of these writings did end up lost by the way and then we get latin apologists uh tertullian augustine lactantius who all um, ended up sort of doing more apologetic than the early Greeks, right? Especially uh, Augustine. Right? He does quite a bit of apologetics. Tertullian, also not a saint, but an early patristic writer who's valuable for that aspect, right? Did a lot of apologetics. The early pagan accusations, what were they? Um, they weren't primarily doctrinal, but they were rather moral. Uh, surprisingly, not, not everything, but a lot of the arguments early on were, look, Christians are immoral. They go to this secret service and they eat flesh and blood. So they'd heard about the Eucharist and they just made this accusation that, oh, they were immoral. They eat, they eat uh, human flesh and blood, right? Um, and other accusations of the uh, Greek Hellenic philosophical crowd were, oh, the Christians, uh, they don't follow the emperor. They defy the emperor, right? Um, Pelican notes that they must have spoken uh, of the real presence. Otherwise, this wouldn't have been confused, right? So they, they definitely believed in the real presence. Plenty of quotes from all the fathers that we've mentioned so far for the real presence. No doubt about that. Um, Christians taught uh, absurd myths. Th these are the three accusations of the Greeks. They taught absurd myths, foolishness, they practiced cannibalisms and cannibalism and they didn't obey the emperor. 
Uh, Pelican notes that Christianity taught a distinctive idea of healing grace for sinners and not an earned forgiveness. So the, the, the doctrine of grace is something that's new here. This hasn't really been conceived of in the sense of pagan thought. And so a lot of the pagans were confused by this. They thought it was foolishness. Uh, the apologists at, during this period noted the horrid uh, and lurid tales of the gods. So one of the most common responses of the apologists was to say, dude, you want to call us immoral? All the stories of your gods are totally degenerate. Give me a break, right? So the apologists uh, focused on that. Uh, the pagans responded by saying, all of our myths are allegories, bro. They're not real. Really? Okay. Interesting. So if they're not real, then what's the basis for morals? Well, go listen to my debates with any of the pagans I've debated. <laughs> right. You'll see, you'll see the exact same problematic. Right. Justin wanted to argue for the superiority of Christianity, uh, and, uh, but also that there was truth in other places. Certainly the Logos Spermaticos. We know about this doctrine. Church of the Eternal Logos just did a whole stream uh, recently on Logos Spermaticos. And so he talks about the uh, the fact that, that there were uh, truths due to the, the Logos doctrine that can be found anywhere because all re reality is basically a manifestation of the Logos. Exactly. And Maximus will, of course, really uh, hammer this out and give the Logi doctrine its full form. Tertullian attributes uh, similar ideas to uh, his system, similar arguments there. Origen is uh, the first to give a real philosophic justification for civil disobedience based on uh, what he calls natural law. Uh, many of the apologists in this period will also claim that Plato had read Moses. You've heard me make mention of this. I think we mentioned it today and last night. Uh, Pelican mentions this on page 33. The pagans also discussed Christianity as an innovation. This is their fourth argument uh, that had no antiquity. So the apologists would typically respond by saying, no, actually all of what we believe was in the Old Testament. And the Old Testament far predates Plato. So you'll see the apologists sometimes making that argument. Uh, Clement criticizes the philosophers for defying, deifying the universe. I don't know if he means Clement of Rome. Uh, or Clement of Alexandria, probably means Clement of Alexandria. Uh, they fought against the co-eternity of matter. Yes, uh, these are typical apologist critiques of the pagans. If matter were co-eternal, then God isn't sovereign. Uh, God has a, uh, it's a dualistic system. Um, this dualistic system collapses uh, in the critique of pantheism. Exactly, You've heard me make this critique. Greek uh, history is viewed as cyclical. I've said this many times. However, Rome was viewed as a uh, manifest destiny. So you have a different conception of what history is between Greeks and Romans. Romans saw themselves as the manifest destiny of history. Christianity then had to give an account for itself historically. Um, in Origins Apologetic, he asserts that history is unrepeatable. Some of the apologists, such as Tertullian, um, conceived of an imminent return of Christ. And so they weren't really worried about history because they thought, well, uh, this is the end of history and we got to have the imminent return of Jesus any, any day now. A lot of the early, early church fathers, first, second century, thought that Christ would return really quick. For Augustine, history is moving from an inception to an ultimate good or goal at the end. All right, so we get... Christianity, he's saying, as you've heard me argue, is a unique view of history itself. Contrary to the Roman and Greek views, Christianity is giving a new philosophy of history, beginning, middle, end. That end is the telos, which is, of course, return of Christ. The Christian ethic. The early apologists wanted to maintain uh, the superiority of the Christian ethic, which Justin called a, quote, new law uh, in the sense of a fulfillment or higher type of ethic than what was just present in the Ten Commandments. Not, not contrary to the Ten Commandments, but stressing and giving a higher law of love that is the real fulfillment of the Ten Commandments. Uh, Origen said that we could speak of a new lawgiver. Uh, Cyprian used the term the law of the gospel. Uh, let's see. So Eusebius, uh, Eusebius wrote the early history uh, of the church. 
he, uh, the history, wait, I don't know what this note means, but he devoted a large part of literary output to in defense of Christianity. Okay. Uh, there's two parts of this, uh, the preparatio evangelica and evangelica and the demonstratio evangelica. So the preparation of the gospel and then the demonstration of the gospel. And then we got, of course, Eusebius as being a historian, uh, which is, it's, it's a kind of an apologetic too, he's saying. Augustine, uh, City of God. I read this when I was 21. Uh, it's an amazing work. Uh, it's an attempt to reply to those who attribute to the sack of Rome uh, Christian guilt. So did the, did the acceptance of Christianity lead to the sack of Rome in 400? Well, let's give a reply to that. The fall of Rome, uh, Augustine says, was due to its failure to recognize the true strength of the Christian church and religion. Uh, he organized all Christian arguments into a philosophy of history. So Augustine is doing an apologetic in City of God from the philosophy of history. The city of God is his, uh, all of the people that love God from the beginning of the world till the end. The city of man is the city of those that love themselves and ultimately serve Satan. The city of God is that heavenly Jerusalem. Uh, by the time of the emperor Justinian, uh, Athens had lost uh, totally and the philosophers left for Persia. They were viewed as harmful uh, within the Catholic empire. So the full defeat of Hellenism, we could say, is by the time of Saint Emperor Saint Justinian. Uh, Justinian, of course, wrote theological works himself. Himself, uh, we have, of course, his theology being confirmed, his restatement of the neo kyrillian view at the Fifth Ecumenical Council. Uh, if you want to read on the person and work of Christ uh, in, by Saint uh, in the in the theology of Saint Justinian by Vesha W E S C A G. next popper uh later we get boethius uh, a late uh, later antiquity author responsible for the constellations of philosophy is kind of a classic you know writing on uh, uh, philosophical ruminations in his jail cell and this is responsible for the early revival of aristotelianism uh the change that i think this is a quote from it or from this may be a quote from pelican i'm not sure Page 45, I guess, of Pelican. The charge that one theological opponent has subordinated the truth of divine revelation to the philosophy of the Greeks is a common one in the history of polemics. So you'll notice that um, the confrontation with Hellenism is constantly brought up, and even Pelican notes that. Boethius uh, presses reason to its limits and speaks on the relationship to natural reasoning clement of alexandria uh more of this uh, really hellenized philosophical approach uh, clement emphasized christ as the true philosopher he is the culmination of all the platonic and aristotelian socratic tradition um, he has been represented as the thoroughgoing hellenizing philosopher uh, he was primarily an apologist uh, he uh, noted in his theology that and by the way i've read these guys i'm just we're just doing Pelican's synopsis, okay? I've read the actual fathers that we're talking about here. The true image uh, of the image was the human mind. The Im image of God is the, is the mind itself. Um, this is the image in the Logos. The Greeks had, in fact, put Zeus there, but really they meant the mind of God, the Logos. Uh, Clement told his pagan philosophical colleagues to complete their correct their views by accepting Christ. So rather than reorienting their entire paradigm, Christ is just kind of the, the top of the scale of the philosophers. No, it's the whole paradigm has to be reoriented. Christ is not just the, the, the highest of the philosophers, right? The whole thing has to be changed. He says Christianity is far superior but it's not exclusive, right? So we can have a high view of Hellenic philosophy. Um, man, in his view, is a duality. There's a strict tension between body and soul. And so he is a kind of middle Platonist. His views of the... Uh, his views of Christ border on being docetic, according to Pelican. Um, Clement also holds to the pre-existence of soul, uh, of the soul doctrine, which is eventually condemned. 
there's a lot of still like platonic influence on Clement. That's why he's problematic. His views are not as much a victory over Greek thought uh, as a uh, mixture of them. Origin, uh, the bodily resurrection uh, is a doctrine for immature Christians. The new body is to be stressed, which is a sphere, <laughs> which is not the same body that we have in our flesh. Obviously, we've covered many times over the, the problems in originism, the uh, denial of creation in the garden. Uh, Eden is rejected. Um, allegories, uh, universalism, Platonism, everything being a creation on the basis of the essence of God. Uh, what else? On and on and on. Uh, there's no compatibility of originism with orthodoxy, no matter how many uh, heretics try to revive origin today. Tertullian was also, ironically, very influenced by philosophy. Even though Tertullian famously stated, what has Athens to do with Jerusalem? And even though he moved further away from Greek thought than either Clement or Origen, uh, uh, he still was influenced by philosophy and still was problematic. Right? We don't, Tertullian is not a saint. He left, he ended his life outside the church. Uh, however, Tertullian did have the famous statement, Plato is the caterer to all heretics. So, so all the heretics love Plato. He's correct about that. Um, uh, Tertullian also defended the biblical doctrine of the creation of the soul against the philosophers. So he certainly had some good points. Uh, he's, first, he's the first, I think, to use the phrase or term trinity. So there's definitely relevance to Tertullian, even though he ended up a quack. St. Gregory of Nyssa. Uh, we make sacred scripture the rule and norm of every doctrine on the soul and resurrection 46-49. He was uh, taught by Origen, uh, but he could not totally escape some influence of the Platonic ideas. So we do uh, believe that St. Gregory of Nyssa is a saint. Uh, he is a church father, but even orthodoxy, we don't believe that everything that a church father said is correct. The two doctrines which uh, evidence the philosophy, uh, evidence philosophical continuity with Christianity, the immortality of the soul, and the absoluteness of God. So he's Pelican saying that there are, of course, similarities that, that the Greeks and the Christians had in common, um, but it couldn't be pressed too much. If you press those similarities too much, you end up in the the Origin Clement camp. If you uh, discount uh, uh, truths, then you go too far and you end up in the puritanical Montanist camp with Tertullian. Immortality. Uh, Aquinas and Melanchthon both wrote uh, lengthy treatises uh, on the soul that are more philosophical than anything theological. Uh, of course, I mean, that should come as no surprise to this audience. <laughs> Uh, in contrast to the Greeks, Christians said that the soul is not itself life, but participates in the life conferred upon it by God. So the soul is not naturally uh, some immortal thing. It's a creation of God. And Irenaeus uh, makes this uh, unique contribution in terms of historical theology and against heresies 234.4, where he argues that the soul is uh, a unique creation. The basis for this insistence was that, uh, that Christianity confessed ex nihilo creation. That was a unique, unique doctrine. Uh, Origen's pre-existence of the soul doctrine ended up eventually condemned multiple times over. Yes, in the 5th, 6th, and 7th councils, the system as a whole of Originism is condemned. Not just the man, the system as a whole. The fall of man was not the result of a prehistoric fall of the soul into bodies, which is what Origen said, which is condemned in the Confession of St. Sophronius. Uh, Ambrose, uh, uh, in fact, said that the doctrine of the immortality of the soul is incomplete without the doctrine of the resurrection. Exactly. So St. Ambrose being far more bib biblical than these other guys. So we give St. Ambrose prop for that. The absoluteness of God. This was that other uh, uh, commonality between what perhaps Greeks at this time thought, Hellenists at this time thought, and what Christian apologists at the first few centuries thought. The Christian view was that God had an absolute sovereign independence and that God was dependent upon his creatures. Or, excuse me, God was not dependent upon his creatures. Yet, 
uh, the Old Testament shows that God's love and his justice and wrath uh, do relate to his covenant people. So the Greek idea of a purely static and personal God was impossible and wrong, according to early Christians. Exactly. We don't believe in an impersonal force. We believe in a personal God, I am. I am is a statement of personhood. We, don't, we can't combine that with Greek essentialism. Divine impassibility, that is the uh, apatheia of God, as it is called, is uh, not the doctrine that God is uh, some sort of impersonal force. Rather, it just stresses the, the fact that God is not dependent on creatures. Gregory Thaumaturgos wrote, uh, in, uh, wrote on this doctrine, uh, and he was an early Syriac uh, writer. All the church fathers are quite united, in fact, in this idea. Right? God is different from creation, separate from creation. He created creation ex nihilo, and he's not dependent on creation. This is the doctrine, again, of the impassibility of the divine nature. Cyril of Alexandria said that anyone who introduces passions into God or into the divine power is an atheist. The whole idea of the fathers thought that this was blasphemous. The impassibility of God came to form one of the other presuppositions of the Trinitarian system. And this view is also foundational to uh, uh, Anselm's later theory uh, based on the apatheia. We don't believe in Anselm's theory, but this is just Pelican's analysis. Uh, Adolf von Harnack says that Adolf Harnack says that most uh, important events of the early church between 150 to 250 AD, uh, what the most important event was that Christianity became a religion of the two testaments. Okay, maybe. Um, against the, the Jewish position, Christian apologists in this time period said that they didn't even under, they didn't even understand their own Old Testament and that it required a spiritual inspiration which began, began to re, came to refer to the New Testament together with the Old. So a holistic covenant testament concept is what's being argued here that the new needs the old and the old needs the new. And that was the apologetic against the Jewish position of the first, second, and third century. Eusebius wrote that Adam, Noah, Abraham, and all of these, it would be no departure from the truth to refer to all of them as Christians. A point in fact. Exactly. Even Origen noted that the apostles and their successors, namely the bishops and priests, according to the great high priest himself, Jesus Christ, know from their instruction by the Holy Spirit uh, for what, why, when, and how we offer the sacrifice. He's talking about the Eucharist. That's Oration 28.9. So the earliest period, we have the, the belief in sacerdotalism. The Decalogue. The early church gave a preeminent place to the Ten Commandments. Uh, Irenaeus mentions this in Against Heresies 4.16.4. Augustine says that the Decalogue is used uh, as our ethical system of instruction. The allegorical and typological exegesis was already prominent at this time period to do apologetics against Jewish opponents. Clement, Athenagoras, and Origen seem to believe in strict mechanical views of inspiration. This is interesting because... Um, even though we don't all hold all these guys to be uh, uh, authoritative, if they do to a degree represent their time, then we know that the early church fathers did not deny inspiration. They did not have a liberal textual view. Therefore, the ancient patristic tradition is that the scriptures are inerrant and inspired. Origen had a hermeneutic that was three-tiered, the literal, the moral, and the spiritual. Uh, Origen and Tertullian agreed that heretics can either rest the plain and simple words of the texts that they choose by their conjectures and speculation, or else they violently resolve them by a literal interpretation of words which are incapable of any solution. So heretics cannot interpret the scriptures correctly. That's Tertullian. Uh, uh, it isn't, I don't know which work that is. 4.19.6. Allegorical, allegorical interpretation grew out of the principle that the Old Testament is, in fact, the words of Christ himself, which presupposes continuity. Deuteronomy 28, 66 and Jeremiah eleven nineteen, 19, 
were texts used to prove the crucifixion. The fathers rebuked the uh, Jews at that time for not understanding the Old Testament correctly. All of this applied to the wisdom amongst the Greeks and the pagans who also were rebuked. I don't understand that note. Greek philosophy was seen as a sort of schoolmaster for the pagans uh, like the law was for the Jews. Uh, the poet Virgil appears to make messianic type prophecies in his fourth Ecologue. I've, I had to write an essay on this in my uh, classics uh, grad class. So there's some really fascinating things in the fourth Ecologue. It seems to be like kind of like the Sybil uh, speak of Christ. Uh, it speaks of a virgin and God descending to man. Uh, it speaks of the things similar to the Sibylline oracles. This is the Virgil text about 40 BC. Sibylline oracles are precious, ancient Roman literature. Many church fathers refer to the Sibylline oracles as a form of Christian prophecy. Sometimes the Sibylline oracles were combined with the Persian author's work, uh, the Hystopes, the Histopes, Histopes, H-Y-S-T-A-P-E-S. -E uh, some people think this could have been a syncretistic uh, conglomeration. Uh, we mentioned St. Gregory of Nyssa before. Uh, St. Gregory of Nyssa said famously, Truth destroys every heresy, but it accepts what is true from each. Gregory says that the uh, Trinity answers the one and the many problem of monotheism and polytheism because there's equal ultimacy of the one and the many in the triad. It's a famous argument of Gregory of Nyssa. Uh, moving on to chapter two in Pelican. The major heresies of the first and second centuries focus more on the radical discontinuity with the Old Testament. Uh, rather than being Judaized. Marcion is, a, of course, one of the early famous first heretics after Simon Magus. Marcion said that the saving God of the New Testament is completely different from the wrathful, mean God of the Old Testament. We hear this everywhere today. Right? Montanism had a, 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 a heresy that believed in new revelations, right? beyond the death of John and his apocalypse being the final revelation of the apostles. Now we got new revelations. Uh, the, the, the charismatics of their day, right? And they literally were. The Gnostics had a secret wisdom that was hidden from all the previous generations and from the public. He had to join the Gnostic sect to get the secret keys. Uh, and this, um, the unifying element at this time period between Marcionites, Montanists, and Gnostics is the Old Testament. They all err on that. And not just the Old Testament, but the New Testament being the completion and the finality of public revelation all the heretics and the orthodox agreed that there was one truth which both parties claimed to possess so it wasn't a debate over whether there was truth but it was a debate over what was true and what wasn't in early usage the term heretic by the early church fathers and schismatic were more or less synonymous uh, the technicalities take on a later canonical distinction. Uh, a dominant characteristic was that heretics always created dissensions, divisions, and difficulties in opposition to the public doctrine that the church confessed. Augustine defined heresy as those who hold false opinions about God and do damage to the faith itself on faith and the creed 1021 schismatics are those who with wicked separations break off from brotherly charity although they may, may believe what we believe in terms of doctrine since this is uh, the early period the distinction is not easy to maintain between heresy and schism justin martyr said that heresy was the doctrine of demons tertullian said that heresies were instigated by the philosophers uh, saint hippolytus said that heretics care not for the truth of scripture but justify their ungodliness by their own opinions. Irenaeus said that heretics seek to uh, adopt good, the good, they seek to adapt the terms of revelation to fit their own heretical twisted meanings. The early church was characterized by unity, fidelity to the Old Testament, and devotion to the message of the New Testament, uh, though they may not have had a completed canon at this period. So I'm like, I'm glad that Pelican admits that. And by the way, Pelican uh, was a Lutheran for many, many years and ended up uh, Orthodox eventually, as far as I'm aware. 
Irenaeus uh, thought that a uh, coming millennium was likely and that this was necessary for orthodoxy. This is one of the areas where Irenaeus is incorrect. He's also incorrect about the age of Christ, obviously. So again, we don't believe everything a church father said. Pelican says that the early church uh, was not characterized uh, by explicit unity on all of these points, right? So he's, he's saying that like premillennialism, these are just kind of obscure opinions that this or that guy might have. Heresy came to be viewed as the aberration of what had been handed down, right? the apostolic deposit. So departing from the apostolic deposit is during the first, second, third centuries what def would define heresy. And so we can say that this pattern of sound words, uh, to use Paul's uh, phraseology, is what would make up what we would call, what he calls the primitive Catholicism, right? Because the kerygma, the dogma, has to be the same throughout the apostolic deposit. So wherever the apostles went, they handed down one faith, one kerygma, gospel, one evangelium, evangelium right? Uh, one uh, uh, teaching. And so it has to be unified in its truth, in its totality. In terms of the totality of what's dogmatic, right? There might be, again, Irenaeus might pop up and have a wrong opinion on something that's not a central core doctrine. Right? And what do we mean by the central core doctrines? Well, that will eventually be what comes becomes the creed. <clears throat> Heresy is uh, notable uh, because it eventually leads to evil deeds, what was the motivation for all heretics? Ego and vainglory, right? They're not ultimately concerned with what's true, but merely for ego and vainglory. So uh, welcome. We've still got, uh, if you're new, we've still got 270 guys here <laughs> live. We've been going for a long time, I know, but we did a, a long Q&A and I did say that we would do Pelican. Uh, so we're, we're covering Pelican's volume one here, seeing how much progress we can make before we move into other things. But it's great to know this early church because a lot of people don't know this early church stuff, right? I might even cut this section off and do it, put this up as a separate video. But uh, if you're here still and you do want to do uh, super chats, I'm still taking super chats. And you can ask me those via the Streamlabs link, just like OK put. And uh, I'll put it there again. And so let's cover, let's see, Aquinas' definition of heresy, uh, just to know what his position is. One who no longer holds to the church as an infallible rule, but to his own will. Yeah, eventually, as time goes on, of course, the church gets more and more specified in how they define heresy. Uh, back to the heretics. Um, the Gnostics have an anti-Jewish sentiment to them. Precisely because they wanted no Old Testament revelation. None of that could be true. That's impossible. One of the early heretics is Serdo. Serdo was an early Gnostic heretic and he was Marcion's teacher. Serdo uh, taught that Christ had a phantasmal existence. He was a hologram. The Old Testament God is a mean, cruel God. And the New Testament God is one of love and uh, hippie Jesus. Rasta Jesus, right? The only resurrection that exists is not some physical body, but a resurrection that's spiritual and of the soul so the denial of physicality bodily resurrection marcion is the uh first great heretic uh, after simon the mages uh, and he says that it's uh Capelicon says that he may have formed he these basic ideas and opinions on his own uh later after he studied under cerdo because uh it says he, he, for some reason, he decided that Luke and only some of Paul's epistles are authentic. So Marcion ended up excommunicated by the Church of Rome before his affiliation with Serdo, he says. This is about 140 AD. Uh, Marcion's father was the Bishop of Sinope. Uh, he founded his own church there, Marcion. Tertullian says in his principal work, uh, uh, against Marcion that the separation of the law and the gospel was the whole purpose and motivation of uh, Marcion. So you notice that the later Lutheran heresy will be very similar to what Marcion says. Lutheranism is, is very influenced by Marcionism. 
mean, Luther says he wanted to punch Moses' teeth out. Luther hated the idea that law was somehow uh, compatible with gospel. He sets up a dialectic between them. It's separation of law and gospel. Marcion denied the bodily resurrection. He said that this world is bad in itself. It's a evil thing. And uh, especially evil in this world were reptiles and insects. <laughs> I mean, they're always like kind of quacks and, and loons, right? Uh, not only were bugs and insects or, or reptiles and insects inherently bad, uh, sex and childbirth were exceptionally unclean actions. So here we get the, you know, weird uh, ascetic uh, uh, sex is evil in itself type of stuff, which will pop up later in the Middle Ages uh, in the, in the, uh, uh, the medieval heretics when we covered the Malcolm Lambert book. Tertullian says the origin of evil is a celebrated topic amongst the heretics. The heretics love to use the problem of evil, origin of evil thing to try to come up with all these crazy ideas of what evil is. Marcion argued that since a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, there must be two gods to explain the two principles operant in the world, good and evil. To fully achieve the distinction of good and evil and a good and evil god, two different gods, he split the Old Testament into two, with the Old Testament being the bad god. The old law was uh, juridical, and then there's the new god that is loving. He may have thought that the creator was not necessarily altogether evil, but he had not at any time shown himself um, to be the new God. Uh, the new God, the good God, has no wrath, no judgment, no vengeance. He, the new love God, had no work, nor any prophecy, nor accordingly was there any any had he at any time in the Old Testament shown himself. Yeah, so, so the God of love was nowhere back there in the Old Testament. Um, the new God is wholly other from the old God. Jesus, in this view of Marcion, uh, is not, therefore, fully or truly man. The historical Jesus is nothing like or in any way connected to an Old Testament prophesied Messiah. And you'll notice that Marcionism is present all through modern academia, modern liberal Christianity, modern so-called Orthodox. They're all Marcionites. They don't. They think the Old Testament God's an evil God. Right? Man uh, must therefore be delivered from all suffering and change within creation, uh, not by a changing and suffering uh, Creator, but man must how must somehow be delivered from it almost sounds buddhist right existence is suffering right so gotta be delivered from this i guess jesus is revealed as a uh, as a full-grown man at, at one time he just like pops there right? he pops into existence full-grown man he had an angelic body he's like an avatar being and it says his passion doctrine was somewhat more orthodox. So apparently Marcin did th thought he did undergo some kind of suffering, I guess. Uh, there's an emphasis on the disc discontinuity here. Uh, creation is uh, distinct and in dialectical tension with salvation. Law is in dialectical tension with gospel. Man is in dialectical tension with the Christ. Old is in dialectical tension with the new, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the God of the Jews was radically separate, different from the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so when Jesus is talking about the Father, it's not the God of the Old Testament. The Old Testament was something to be abolished, not fulfilled. Uh, Matthew five seventeen, right? I have not come to uh, abolish the law, but to fulfill it. So you'll notice that Marcion really can't be consistent with new testament texts or paul hence why he had to like cut and paste his own little new testament together and this is what all heretics do ultimately they end up saying well then i don't even want your 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 biblical text <laughs> right luther luther is kind of the first to begin the tradition of higher criticism right i don't luther says i, I doubt james hebrews and revelation and then you get german higher criticism
Old Testament prophecies of David's kingly son uh, have nothing to do with Jesus. It's just talking about Solomon. Um, Luke 5.37 is a radically new law from Jesus and nothing to do with the Old Testament. Uh, St. Paul alone knew what the truth was, Marcion says, <laughs> meaning that Paul alone saw the Gnostic truth here, that the Old Testament's an evil God. That's ludicrous. I mean, how many times, even in the epistles that, that Marcion wants to retain, Paul still has continuity with the Old Testament. It's just, it's not very well thought out. Uh, ironically, here's a, here's an interesting fact. Uh, the first person to produce a New Testament canon of scripture is Marcion. <laughs> His chopped up, uh, you know, one gospel and some of Paul is the first canon of scripture. Um, it's the wrong canon, but it's the first one. Uh, he says the made up arbitrary, uh, Luke plus Paul canon of scripture will become uh, will make him important in terms of the development of the New Testament canon. So ironically, as we, we typically see as the case, the heretics in, initiate what becomes the response of the Orthodox, right? So because Marcion has made up this bogus canon, uh, this truncated, uh, cut up canon like Luther did and like all heretics do, the church responds by giving their canon eventually. Uh, this controversy of Marcion says led to the increasing tendency to cite the apostles as authoritative. So this is what's going to provoke the rise of the need for a canon. Does the canon doesn't come yet, but it starts to provoke the need for that. During the second half of the second century, the Marcionite church ruled the rivaled the Orthodox church for size. That's interesting. Now remember, that's important because numbers don't determine orthodoxy. We're really going to see that in the Arian crisis. But note that Pelican says in the second half of the second century, the Marcionite heretics were just as big as the Orthodox. Justin says in many nations, Justin says many nations have been, many nations had already been persuaded of Marcion's heresy. Marcion's works were revered. Uh, almost like scripture amongst the Marcionites. Some said that Paul was at Christ's right hand and Marcion was at Christ's left hand. <laughs> um, Apelles uh, was a Marcionite sectarian reviled the, who reviled the dualism and docetism of his master Marcion. Christ's body had not been born, though it was a real body. It was made up of the stars. So he remained Marcionite in it. So in other words, there's a, there's a split. One of the Marcionite heretics, Apelles, said Jesus is star seed, whatever. Uh, just nonsense, right? No early Christians interpreted uh, the Old Testament in a strictly literal view. So the accusation of Marcion, first of all, was wrong because orthodoxy didn't only read the Old Testament literally, right? We have a literal level of reading and then there's also the spiritual level so this is one of the mistakes of marcion to begin with um even uh, pelican is able to note the similarities between luther and marcion <laughs> exactly uh, you hear that dr soy cooper i mean jordan cooper uh, there's similarities between marcion and luther yeah exactly Uh, next, we move to the different Gnostic systems, systems of cosmic redemption, Gnosticism. Uh, according to the early church, the true Gnostic or knower, right? The knower of truth is the Christian. So the word itself, the true Gnostic, Maximus speaks of Christians as the true Gnostics. There's nothing wrong with the term, but as a movement, it becomes uh, the people who start to see a cosmic redemption for the spirit of man through gnosis or knowledge. The inner man is renewed through gnosis. Uh, it is a bizarre combination of different groups practicing magic, mythology, philosophy, and demonic ideas, according to the apologists. Christian, Christian quote-unquote, Gnosticism originated with different Jewish groups. 
uh, the Jesus of these groups came to uh, came to save Helen from her bonds and offer salvation from the body. So the earliest Gnostic mythologies were that salvation really is about being saved from a physical body. One of the earliest uh, Gnostics is Serenthus. Serenthus had a distinction between God the Creator and the Supreme God, right? So the Demiurge uh, is, you know, Yalda Baoth versus the Demiurge, this kind of stuff. Christ descended uh, uh, upon the person Jesus at his baptism. Here we have adoptionism. Uh, and then when Jesus was crucified, the Christ spirit left him at the crucifixion. So they just take all these verses and reinterpret things in these weird secret Gnostic ways. Next Gnostic is Saturninus. Saturninus had a uh, sharp distinction between creation and redemption. Christ came to destroy the God of the Old Testament. Uh, the, the, the God of Christianity must overcome the evil God of Judaism. Again, you see the pattern here? All of this comes from our testimony in uh, Irenaeus and Just a Martyr and our, the other early church fathers as to what the Gnostics said. Uh, no, but it's not hard to believe given the fact that today's Gnostics all say the same stuff, <laughs> right? I mean, um, next Gnostic, Basilides. Uh, Basilides differed from the main Gnostic teachers uh, like Valentinus in that he was an innovator of Aristotle. Well, uh, Valentinus, the next famous uh, Gnostic, was a Pythagorean and a Platonist. Uh, apparently, Basilides says a non-existent God created the world. <laughs> so, uh, that's a great argument there. That's actually the argument of the Big Bang, right? Uh, there is there is no God, but that non-existent nothing created everything. So... Uh, the Big Bang proponents are actually just Basilidian heretics or Gnostics. All right, let me turn the light on. It's getting dark in here. What well, epic stream, bro? Epic stream, bro. We've been going for what four hours, three, four hours, and we're covering Pelican. I may split this, right? I, I may split the Q and A first half apart from this part. But we still got 280 people. Welcome. We're covering uh, Pelican Emergence of the Catholic Tradition, which I read in 2002, by the way. And I took uh, hundreds of pages of notes on all these volumes. Just saying, I've been reading this stuff for a long time. But it's good to review some of this stuff because obviously over time you don't retain every detail. So it's good. It's, it's fun to review. And we are still taking super chats. We haven't had one in 26 minutes. So if you do feel inclined, you may offer up a super chat. Uh, this is, of course, one of the key classic texts on the early church period. Uh, it's, it's used in seminaries. It's used across the board in academia. Uh, nobody doubts or disputes the accuracy and scholarly pedigree of Pelican series. Uh, let's see. The next Gnostic that we're going to talk about is Ptolemy. Uh, Ptolemy was a Valentinian Gnostic. The Aeon, or the Age, is a pre-existent, invisible, eternal, quiet, deep solitude. There are 30 emanations from the Aeon. They are eternal and coexistent. There are two pairs of the 15. One of them is feminine, and the other one is masculine of the 15 pairs. Whatever, dude. <laughs> this, is, this is crazy, right? Uh, what, what drug were you doing, Ptolemy, when you came up with this stuff? Uh, it's a pure rationalism, and Ptolemy, uh, uh, I, I think it's Ptolemy, or it's either Ptolemy or, or a, a famous Gnostic dictum, which says... Abandon your search for God and the creation and other matters of similar sort. Look for him by taking yourself as the starting point. Notice the autonomy of man, right? Learn who it is within you who made everything and his own and says, My God, my word, my soul, my body. Carefully investigate all of these matters and you will find him in yourself. 
So this Gnostic dictum is just, you're your own God, bro. The great Gnostic mystery. You thought it was going to be some, you know, it's just, uh, we're all God, bro, and I'm God, bro. Literally. All this Gnostic gibberish, it's nonsense. It's nothing. It's nothing. The Gnostic fall. The descent of spirit into matter is what characterizes the Gnostic fall. Wisdom, uh, the 30th pleroma, fell through passion and gave birth to a shapeless mass. Presumably that's where this evil creation then comes from. There are three types of men, therefore, in the Gnostic universe here. The psychic man, represented by Abel. The material man, represented by Cain. And the spiritual man, represented by Seth. Uh, the material is beyond salvation. The psyche or the psychic realm is savable, but the highest is the spiritual, which has no need for salvation. It's all just like gibberish. Uh, creation and fall. Creation and fall coincide because the demiurge, the evil creator, didn't know what he was creating. He was a blind, bumbling fool. Uh, his creation was an abortion, an act of ignorance, and they were therefore revulsed, uh, the, the Gnostics were therefore revulsed by human birth, you see. It follows logically from the idea that the created world is evil. Well, then so is new creations coming into this world. So human birth is evil. That's everywhere today. Transhumanism is Gnostic. One of the Gnostic groups were called the Incratites. They preached uh, uh, consistent with that argument and argued that therefore marriage was evil. Uh, marriage is, is the uh, part of the original creation in Eden, which was by the evil God. And so therefore, if you were married, you were participating in the evil actions of the creator God. By the way, the Incratites also were vegans and they're condemned as heretics were also for being vegan. The Sat Saturninus, uh, one of the Gnostics, said that Satan is actually the uh, the evil god, Jehovah, and he is the one who created marriage. Now you can start to see why they just flip things. So Satan becomes now a liberator. Because if the creator god is the evil god, then the one who defies him is the good god. The Gnostic... Sethian Ophites said that man was a pre-existent soul in some platonic realm or whatever. And though creation is bad, some have an angelic spark of divinity, the Gnostic, right, who, who discovers the deity within himself. And that through that Gnosis, he can then like transcend and, you know, go be his own God or whatever. Uh, the lower caste are the bodily men and those who are the profane that are not Gnostics, not initiated, not part of the true Gnostic church, and they are beyond redemption. They're profane. The major Gnostic texts of this period are the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Philip, the Gospel of Truth, and the Gospel of Peter. Basilides said that Simon of Cyrene was actually who was crucified and not Christ. You hear Muslims make this not argument. They just borrow it from Gnostics. Um, the body that was uh, uh, crucified actually could not suffer. Uh, salvation, in fact, is only a what pertains to the soul. There's no salvation for the body. So early on, Ignatius had to write against those who denied the full humanity of Christ. So that's Ignatius of Antioch. That's early on. For Gnostics, the cross is uh, consuming and destroying matter, and it purifies the Gnostic church. <laughs> uh, the Helen character is... A representation of the lost sheep, the Gnostics, who need salvation from the physical realm. The New Testament term for the elect, the chosen, that is a reference to the Gnostic himself. Man must ascend through Gnosis and knowledge back to the transcendent God. Uh, the story of the Gnostic gospel was salvation itself. The ascent of pure thought is the only way of salvation. Uh, excuse me, the ascent of pure thought is only half of salvation. The total destruction of matter is the other half. So the Gnostic is ascending into pure thought. The material realm has to be destroyed. I mean, what's more satanic than this just gibberish? 
Spiritual men would be saved because they were spiritual against the flesh and regarded and regardless of their conduct or life, it didn't matter. So moral living doesn't matter in this, this system, you see. Uh, the psychic would have to have a faith to remain celibate and to be saved. Doesn't mean a psychic like a person who predicts the future, but the man who uh, uh, is the second tier, because there's three types of people in this system, right? Uh, the psychic being the lower person who could be saved uh, uh, below the spiritual man, and then the profane bodily man can never be saved. Only those inducted into the Gnostic mysteries had these the truth and could be saved and were the true Christians. This Gnosis was in uh, a secret apostolic tradition that was not public, but was only handed down to the Gnostic sects. Freemasonry, right? This is like the same type of stuff that, that we see argued in Freemasonry. The other Gospels were accounts of Christ uh, that were other teachings, supposedly. The true interpretation of the scriptures cannot be known without the Gnostic traditions that are, in fact, secretly held amongst the Gnostic elite. The Old Testament is spoken by a different deity, uh, some of it by the true Satan God, and the Gnostics who use uh, an allegorical interpretation would allegorize all the events of the Old Testament or whatever into some weird Gnostic thing. Now, why are they having to allegorize it if it's the, the evil God speaking, <laughs> right? It would seem that Clement and Origen were influenced by Gnostics of this period. Absolutely. Um, Montanism, the next great heresy. Montanus was a Phrygian pres presbyter around 135 to 175. The opponents of Montanus are the principal sources for his beliefs. And he uh, eventually made a convert of a church father named Tertullian. So Tertullian eventually ended his days as a Montanist. Montanism is an effort to shape the life of the church in keeping with the expectation of an imminent return of Christ. So they were, they were an apocalyptic kind of charismatic cult is what we're going to see. Uh, they oppose all... Anybody who didn't believe in an imminent return was opposed. Get out of our cult. You're not... This is the end times, bro. Um... They grew out of persecution, so the persecution made them feel like it was the end times, and so uh, it gave rise to a hierarchy. Wait, the, the the rise of I can't read my notes. I think it says hierarchy and decline of an imminent return doctrine are simultaneous, according to Pelican. Um. The Montanists argued that there needed to be charismata, charismatic gifts, and that because the church was now formulaic and ritualistic, it had lost its charismatic power. Um, one of the texts was the Ascension of Isaiah, an apocalyptic work that spoke of an earthly, uh, ap uh, an early apostasy and early return of Christ. So I guess the Montanists like the... Uh, Ascension of Isaiah. Montanus said that Christ's promise of the coming of the Spirit was fulfilled in him. <laughs> Montanus said he was Pentecost. <laughs> yeah, well. Uh, he identified himself as the paraclete, as the Spirit. Uh, and he said that this being the case, it was a sign of the end of the world. Eusebius says that Montanus did uh, ecstatic gibberish, talking in tongues, as a display. This Spirit would feel fill two of his female assistants and that they would converse with the angels of God. Montanus could then interpret these gibberish phrases as angelic speak. It's all the same heresy of charismatics in this clown. Uh, Montanus uh, came up with a holy roller strict doctrine, right? Where, um, uh, people could receive the baptism of the spirit and the power that Montanus had if they would follow the, the full ethical commands of, of Montanus. Uh, he said the reason that the church lost its power was that they had become morally lax, just typical holy roller nonsense, um, and that they allowed people who, we're not talking about divorce, but here it's talking about anybody who had like you, if your husband or wife died, you couldn't remarry. 
I don't know why, but Montanus said that if you did this, you were uh, uh, you were gone. You're lost. Uh, he said that uh, people weren't doing the fasts like they should, and therefore the church had apostatized. Montanus, uh, it is it is claimed, said he was the incarnation of the Spirit. So Jesus was the incarnation, the incarnate Logos. Montanus was the incarnate Spirit. Some of the Montanists were modalists and anti-Trinitarian, uh, just like today's uh, one is Pentecostals. Uh, others were Trinitarian. Again, all the same heresies then, here today. Why is that? Because it's the same demons, that's why. S uh, some of the Montanists, however, uh, appear to have had a fairly orthodox doctrine of the Trinity, Pelican says, uh, even Tertullian appears to to uh, be fairly orthodox on the Trinity. Uh, Tertullian, in fact, is the first person to use the term Trinity in the Latin. Eusebius said that there, uh, the manifestations of the Montanists were, in fact, demons. Hippolytus of Rome. Hippolytus of Rome is the first apologist to come up with a better critique of Montanism. Uh, St. Hippolytus says that the... Uh, Church is not necessarily living at the end of the world. Uh, prophecy as a public revelation ended with the Gospel of John. Uh, that was the last prophecy of the Holy Spirit, according to St. Hippolytus. And no, no one post-apostolic period had a right to claim that the Holy Spirit was speaking through them because revelation had ceased with the death of John. Um, inspiration that, Marthi, that Marcion claimed would grow uh, uh, obsolete because the church was, the, was beginning to solidify its doctrines of authority at this time period. Scripture, the creed, the apostolic succession, and the bishopric, right, uh, is what would begin in this time period of the second century to mark orthodoxy. Sorry, Protestants. Thus, already at this time period, apologists early on in the post-apostolic period were beginning to say that in order to be considered orthodox, you needed to prove yourself from Scripture, adhere to the creed, and have apostolic succession and tradition. The, the idea that the Holy Spirit uh, would lead uh, the church into all truth uh, is what would characterize the argumentation at this period. And eventually there was the idea that there would be a closed canon. That's down the road. I'm getting a little, I'm getting a little tired because we've been going for a while here, but we'll keep going. All three previously viewed heresies had uh, that we just discussed had common denominators of the issue of continuity with the Old Testament. So all these heretics and heresies in this first period opposed the mainstream churches as, oh, they're all evil, they're all apostate, right? We are the true church. So whether it was the Marcionites, the Gnostics, or the Montanists, everybody agreed that continuity with the Old Testament was the problem. All right, with, Mar with Marcion, evil Old Testament God, same with, with, with Gnostics, and with Montanists, uh, I'm, I'm still the Holy Spirit, right? Though who cares what the apostles said because the Holy Spirit is speaking through me, right? I'm the continuation, right? The Pope, right? the Holy Spirit is speaking through the Pope presently, right? We've got to follow him. The Old Testament was used by the apostles. Um, okay, so, so at this point, the church fathers are beginning to make arguments for the criteria of what constitutes apostolic continuity continuity with the old testament the old testament was used by the apostles the apostles interpreted it in a spiritual typological and christological way therefore it was valid when it was properly understood and used so it's not the old testament itself that's the problem obviously irenaeus said that only the true and spiritual could understand the typology of the old testament meaning only those who had the holy spirit the old testament focused on creation the created order, and the New Testament focus on redemption. They both go together. They both presuppose and assume one another. The apostles spoke as faithful messengers of Christ, and this meant that the whole apostolic uh, community 
and uh, this is part of the whole apostolic community, and therefore it was commonplace for heretics to pick a part of the apostolic witness and set it in contrast to other parts. They would adopt it to their system, and they would uh, elevate some piece or part of Revelation over the rest of Revelation. For example, think of Luther with <laughs> the book of James. Uh, the Ebionites, uh, they preferred Matthew only. The Marcionites, they preferred Luke only and Paul only. The Gnostics, they preferred the Gospel of Mark or John only. Marcion said uh, that the polemic of Galatians was directed at the false apostles like Peter, James, and John. So he would set apostles against one another just like Luther did. He consistently uh, referred to the conflict with Peter and Paul when they debated. Marcion elevated Galatians above all the other epistles. Early on in this period, quote, scripture referred to the Old Testament and perhaps some of Paul's epistles. Again, because there's no, there's no defined New Testament canon yet. You see that, Protestants? Did you hear that? In this time period, when they're using the term scripture, they mean the Old Testament and perhaps some of Paul's epistles. Irenaeus speaks of the plethora of matters contained in the scriptures. And by the context, Irenaeus means more than just the Old Testament. He says that what had been preached by the voice of the apostles was now handed down in the scriptures as the pillar and bulwark of faith, as well as mentioning the tradition of the apostles. So if you read Irenaeus, you'll find books three and four of Against Heresies where he, re he references uh, scripture and tradition and apostolic succession. That's the three-tiered stool of authority in the church. When scripture was cited against the Gnostics, they claimed that the opponents, wait, hold on, I missed a, I missed a quote here. Um, at this time period, the lists of canonical and accepted books was in fluctuation. It was fluctuating. But the doctrines did not fluctuate. Irenaeus notes this. He says that the apostles are the voice of the mother city of citizens of the new covenant. They are the voice of the heavenly city. When scripture was cited against the Gnostics, they claimed that the opponents lacked the secret traditions necessary to unlock the keys of how to interpret the scriptures. Scripture uh, is a body of traditions which had been handed down. Wait. The Gnostics said that scripture could only be understood by a body of secret traditions handed down in the Gnostic sects. Irenaeus replied to the Gnostics that one must refer to the tradition from the apostles. The tradition from the apostles is what would properly interpret and unlock the keys of the, uh, the, the Bible and the Old Testament. However, it was not done secretly like the Gnostics, uh, but it was a public confession in the church available to anyone who had come to know successors to the apostles. So you could go to the churches where the uh, apostles had successors and there's not secret Gnostic doctrines. The apostolic tradition is public profession. So that's what contrasts the Gnostic tradition to the Orthodox tradition. One of them is secret. The other one is public in the churches with the apostolic succession. Origen defined it as the doctrine of the church transmitted in an orderly way from the apostles and remaining in the churches down to the present time. Pelican says, together with the Old Testament, the canon of the new uh, and the tradition of the church, this was a decisive criterion for the determination of doctrine. There was not at this time period a notion of sola scriptura, nor was there a traditio alone in the... Uh, uh, in this uh, anti-Nicene church period. There was, in fact, a relationship that was the apostolic deposit, the, tr the total body of tradition that the apostles taught, which was also scripture. Scripture in part, and also oral tradition in part. Again, there was no notion of sola scriptura at this time period. <sighs> Sorry, Protestants. Tradition included, at this time period, multiple elements. Liturgy, exegetical material from the of previous fathers and scripture. Did you hear that? What have you heard me argue? That very thing. Book three of Against Heresies by Irenaeus deals with all of these things. The tradition was so palpable that even the uh, if the apostles had not written down scripture, the church could still function 
and operate based on just the tradi traditions that they handed down, even it was, if it was unwritten. This was evident in the barbarian nations where men could not read and write, but had the true faith. So Irenaeus in book three, section four, section two, says that we don't even need a written tradition to have the church. What could be more devastating to the stupid argumentation of Sola Scriptura in this period than that? Pelican notes that the rule of faith sometimes meant scripture, sometimes it meant apostolic tradition other than scripture, and sometimes it just meant the gospel itself, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Though Irenaeus, Tertullian, St. Hippolytus, and others differ, they usually acknowledge Father, Son, Spirit, death of Christ, burial, and resurrection as the core doctrines. This is where we're eventually going to get the Nicene Creed, you see. That's where he's going with this. Tradition, loosely speaking, will eventually be encompassed in the Creed. Irenaeus does appear in uh, Against Heresies 110.1 to quote some version of an early creed. Uh, Tertullian also appears to, to quote some version of an early creed in his Apologetic 47.10. Irenaeus said apostolic tradition provided the correct interpretation of the Old and New Testaments in contrast to the Gnostics. Scripture also paved or proved the apostolic tradition, and thus the whole world, he argued, held to this as one faith. Part of this one faith includes the apostolic succession of the bishoprics. Chief among those was the church at Rome. This is against Heresies 3, 3, 1. By the way, he does not say that the church of Rome had anything special because of Peter. He doesn't say it has any infallibility. There's no Petrine charism. All he says is that Rome has a primacy due to Peter and Paul, double apostolic. Nothing like Vatican I there. Uh, in fact, Irenaeus' statement is fully orthodox. The orthodox love that statement. The faith demand, this is 180, by the way, if you don't know. The, the, the fathers demanded that the heretics produce a true lineal descent from the apostles. If they could not produce a true lineal descent of successors, then they were invented as a sect that came later. Did you hear that, Protestants? The fathers of the first, second, third period demanded that heretics produce a true lineal descent of bishops and that if they could not, then they must have come much later and therefore be parasynagogues. It was inevitable that the heretics would thus lose continuity and unity of doctrine. The heretics do not have a unity of doctrine and they do not have any continuity of the succession of bishops. No one was be to be received as a preacher with any authority unless they were in an apostolic church. St. Cyprian was a pupil of Tertullian. St. Cyprian interpreted Matthew 16, 18 as both Peter and as well as many other, uh, 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 as a power given to Peter that also symbolized the power of the other apostles and the bishops. So every bishop is a Peter. Eusebius in his uh, ecclesiastical history actually starts his argumentation with apostolic succession. So notice, anybody who's a Protestant, you have no connection to any of this. Pelican admits, and Pelican wrote this as a Protestant. Pelican admits on page 119, this system did produce a visible unity. Do you hear this? Do you hear this? This is one, two, three hundreds. This system, apostolic succession, tradition, no soul scriptura, did produce a visible unity. The faith of the Catholic Church of this period. Many of these works do, uh, do have to undergo criticism because of alterations, because of forgeries, because of uncertainties. So we do have to do textual criticism. Nothing wrong with that, right? Nobody believes that all of the, what claims to be from this period is, is valid. That doesn't mean that we have no knowledge of this period any more than it means we have no knowledge of the text of Scripture. But we do have uh, to do criticism 
And there have been many centuries of textual criticism that has shown forgeries. Most famous of which are the papal forgeries, the mountains of them. Galatian decretals, pseudo-Isidorian decretals, donation of Constantine. Oh, there's tons of these. And the Vatican doesn't even accept these anymore, right? Known forgeries. Christ came to bring the new era, uh, apocalyptic vision and transformation. So here we're going to have the attitude of what the church is and her relationship to eternity. Christ came to bring uh, this message, this new era. Uh, he brought heaven to earth. The church thus is the invasion of heaven into earth to break the demonic powers. Baptism is the renunciation of the past life and entrance into this new world, into this new kingdom of God. The kingdom is thus set up at the first advent of Christ, according to all of these fathers of this period. No dispensationalism, no premillennial gobbledygook gibberish. The church is the kingdom. Early eschatological views in the first, second century. Some of the church fathers at this time period appeared to be premillennial. Papias, uh, Papias claims his premillennialism came from an unwritten tradition. Uh, this is what Eusebius says. Irenaeus cites Papias to back up his premillennialism. The epistle of Barnabas also appears to be premillennial. Justin says that there are other Orthodox men who do not believe in his premillennial ideas, Dialogue of Tripo the Jew, 80, section 2. Origen says that these guys are wrong, right? Premillennialism is not true. But it does appear that Justin, Irenaeus, Methodius, the Epistle of Barnabas, and the Shepherd of Hermas favor premillennialism. The already not yet view was celebrated in the Apostolic Constitutions, however, concerning the Eucharist. Apostolic Constitution 7, 26, 5. So this is early uh, Apostolic Canons, Constitutions, early witness to tradition. There's debate. Debate going on between, you know, what in what sense is the millennium here or is it coming? During this time period, we already get to we, we already begin to have people arguing, arguing for the was is and is to come a, a attitude of uh, Christ. The incarnation was the case. The the Eucharist is the case, and the second advent is to come. Was is is to come already not yet. Many pre, uh, patristic writers in this period are preoccupied at times with the identity of who the Antichrist might be. A lot of church fathers, due to the persecution, said, oh, it was uh, Commodus, Commodius. Oh, it's Nero, right? Irenaeus said the Antichrist would be the uh, from the tribe of Dan. Hippolytus agrees that he would be from the tribe of Dan. Hippolytus wrote a commentary on Daniel, which is partially preterist and the oldest extant commentary. He denies an imminent return. You hear that? Clement, Origen, Gregory of Nyssa come close to saying that we don't know about eschatology. I'm not sure what that note means. Uh, if we come to, close to saying that there's not an eschatology, this could conceivably deny the creed. It merely went I don't know what this note means. It merely went beyond the creed and was tolerated. So it's whatever Pelican is talking about in the eschatology section. I don't remember what he's saying. But Augustine set the stage for uh, mill millenarian views in the West with his rejection of premillennialism and his adoption of what appears to be on mill or post mill. Faustus, uh, wait. The, the fathers also applied an already not yet scheme, not just to the kingdom, but also to salvation itself. We are already saved and we will be saved. The Gnostics spiritualized the second advent and the bodily resurrection to mean nothing a, a historical, nothing literal. Uh, the supernatural order. Uh, so the Greek and Roman religions are argued by the, the fathers of this early period to be of demonic inspiration. It doesn't mean they don't have any truth at all, but they're corruptions of the truth under demonic inspiration. Angels and demons 
were viewed as beings that really existed, but were higher than man and lower than God. The Gnostics worshipped angels, uh, which they at times referred to as aeons. Uh, this may be what Paul is referring to in Colossians 2.18. Angels are creatures. They are not uh, minor gods. Uh, Nicaea set a limit on angelic speculation by saying that God is the creator of all things visible and invisible. Demonology, uh, it's something that develops in the post-apostolic fathers a little more than angelology. Uh, Genesis 6, 1 through 4 is typically interpreted as fallen angels in this time period. Um, pagan deities are identified with uh, these fallen angels. <clears throat> Origen said that demons were awaiting, were waiting to lead Christians astray and that Christians should cultivate the help of angels. So even in Origen's day, there was the idea that we could ask for the intercession of angels. We had a question about that earlier. The dualism of the Gnostic and Marcionite uh, schemes and Manichaean systems denied by necessity the full sovereignty of one God. Uh, when writing against Manichaean dualism, uh, Augustine defined evil as the way that many Neoplatonic philosophers had defined evil as an absence of the good. It was at Nicaea that the boundary line between creator and creature was strictly defined in the Nicene Creed 140. Soteriology, salvation. What is the meaning of salvation, generally speaking, in the teaching of the early church fathers? The saving doctrine of Christ's work remained undefined for the first few centuries, through, uh, though, uh, though the historical events did not. So they were mainly debating not soteriology, but you know the veracity of the Old Testament with Marcion and this kind of stuff. The Gnostics saying the Old Testament was not true. Uh, Irenaeus' uh, focus is the doctrine of recapitulation. He sees Christology and soteriology united in this doctrine of Christ recapitulating the fall of Adam. The Logos assimilated himself to man and man to himself in his life and in his passion. In each stage of human development, Christ redeemed each person by way of example. So because he became an infant, he was able to save an infant. He therefore undid what Adam had caused. Orthodoxy, of course, still retains the importance of the doctrine of recapitulation completely lost in the West. Sacrifice is used only of the Eucharist at this period. In the Sacrifice is used, oh, excuse me. Sacrifice is used early on of the Eucharist in the Didache. The Didache, the Didache cites Malachi 1.11 as a reference to the Eucharist as a sacrifice. Cyprian uh, devotes a long treatise to the Eucharist as a sacrifice in the 3rd century. Satisfaction. How do we make satisfaction to God? Repenting and making reconciliation, according to Tertullian, is what satisfaction is. Hillary is the first to apply this term to the death of Christ. The Gustav Alin Christus Victor, right, as we mentioned earlier, this is borrowing from this, uh, this stuff. The ransom theory of the atonement. Ransom theory became recognizable first in origin. The focus of the second and third century fathers is upon the example, passion, and death of Christ. The mysterious element is the ransom. This has been called the classic theory of victory over God's enemies, or Christus Victor. Origen said that it was not enough for Christ to provide an example, but his uh, death actually had to overthrow the power of Satan himself. This was developed more fully in Irenaeus uh, on the basis of Genesis 3.15 and Matthew 12.29. The conflict is between the two seeds, one uh, under which uh, the devil rules. Uh, the devil has power over them temporarily. And Christ eventually would win e in, in terms of eternity and his seed would be victorious. Man's salvation is therefore death's destruction. The descent into Hades. The earliest references are from Syriac materials, which refer to uh, simply Christ's death and burial. It was interpreted by Irenaeus and Justin as Christ descending into the realm of Hades and liberating the patriarchs of the Old Testament. 1 Peter 3.19 is uh, used as a uh, evidence of Christ preaching even to the pagans of the Old Testament. What have I, what have I just said? The statement achieved creedal status around 370 
uh, and the descent began to be interpreted as Christ's victory over the realm of Hades and the devils. It became an issue of debate that continued until the Middle Ages and the Reformation. No, it's not an issue of debate in the Orthodox Church. Uh, we have a whole, you know, harrowing of Hades. Origen's ransom theory uh, appeared to lead him to a kind of universalism. Well, we know he teached universalism, but Pelican is saying that maybe on the basis of the ransom theory, the universalism seemed to him to lead to everybody being saved. In its fullest sense, even the devil himself. Thus, origins of pakatastasis means that all will be saved, even Satan. Universalism would, of course, eventually be condemned in the Church Fathers in the 5th, 6th, and 7th centuries. Gregory of Nyssa's version of uh, universalism uh, would not be ultimately acceptable either. Although there's a difference between Gregory's apocatastasis and origins gregory is way more orthodox because apocatastasis is not just one doctrine i've covered it many times it's actually based on a whole bunch of other things like the allegorization of eden pre of souls uh that's the originist system even though gregory doesn't have all that i don't think we can even accept all of gregory Nissa's views anyway uh there was a problem at this period christ did not have to be identified can't read that note problem christ did not have to be identified that i think the note means that christ is not just a moral example there's got to be more to christ's work than just him coming and setting example i think is the point of what i'm trying to now uh, clement of alexander spoke as, of christ as the purifier from sin the savior and the bringer of peace as god he forgave sins and as man he train followers not to sin salvation then is salvation uh from death and the attainment of eternal life so it's not just a moral example it's also it's the gift of eternal life cyprian said that the savior conquered death and this conquering of death is the conquering of death in us uh, cyprian epistle 10.3 salvation from death is also salvation from sin uh, proof of this was Matthew 9, 2 through 9. Soteria, the bringer of health. When Jesus remitted sins, he healed a man. This shows that Christ is the Savior of soul and body. The Eastern view, theosis, salvation as deification. All right, we've been going for a long time. I'm starting to, my mind is turning to mush. Uh, we're a good ways into this now. So we're getting into... Chapter, we're almost done with chapter three. I'll tell you what, I'm going to finish chapter three because I'm almost done. Got to get some water here. I'm good. All right. Uh, chapter four is the Trinity. So if you want part two, subscribe to Jay's analysis. Right? This is not all going to be, uh, you know, everything can't be free, bro. I got to make a living. Uh, chapter four is the Trinity. Uh, and we will deal with Arianism, Nicaea, Nestorianism, that, you know, all that good stuff. Christology, Theotokos, all that will come up. Ephesus. Then we will do questions about nature and grace. Then we'll do Augustine, Pelagius, Orthodoxy in the East. And then we move up into the later period of Gregory the Great in the West. So that'll be in part two. I don't know if I'll do all of that in part two, maybe, depending on how far I get. But we had a good run there. We had a good run. Almost four hours. Over four hours. Got a couple of questions here if I can make my... my I'm not, I, I think I'm going to have to stop. I can't, my mind is turning to mush. Tandem Toad, $3.00. Would uh, eating the fruit be death before the fall? Uh, we don't we don't think that the bodily uh, consumption and all that kind of stuff operated the same way in Eden. So when they fell, they were given uh, animal skins. That's body, right? So we don't know exactly how it worked. Uh, they had bodies, but it was not the kind of bodies that we have. 
Gen Z philosophy, $5. Uh, could you try interviewing? No, I'm not going to interview black Hebrew Israelites. Lindsay, $5. Uh, my chrismation at the Orthodox Church was a week ago. Thanks largely in part to your work. Awesome. Many years. Thank you for everything. And I'm glad to support the channel. Uh, I'm honored to have your support. Uh, I think I missed a couple here. How did Christ through the cross and resurrection affect Hades and paradise? Uh, read the last four paragraphs of book three of John Damascus uh, on the Orthodox, uh, uh, on the Orthodox faith. He answers that very question in just three paragraphs. Lucius. We already did that. Okay. That's everybody. Uh, I hope this was uh, enjoyable. We went for a long time, but I said I would do it. I wanted, I wanted to do it. I want to get through it. Right. Uh, it's a it's a great series. I mean, volume two is good. It's just just the East, right? Spirit of Eastern Christendom, sixteen hundred to seventeen hundred, and uh, you know he covers all the kinds of stuff that you hear me talk about. That mm, oh well, I've got books everywhere. I don't know where it is, but Pelican's other book is actually really good too for an introduction to. Uh, orthodox philosophical concepts but so uh there's first three or four how, how far did we get in the book i think we got about that's the first half of this book so i just covered the first half of this book for you anyway i hope you enjoyed it um god bless everybody i'm sure we'll be back soon if you want the second half subscribe to jay's analysis